Hello and welcome to The Crime Reel. In the second of our seven cases this week, we shall be returning to Valentine's Day 2005 to look at the heartbreaking case of Joanne Nelson. And we ask the question, should life mean life? Joanne Nelson was a 22-year-old lady from Yorkshire in England. She was the eldest daughter born to Charlie and Jean Nelson, who went on to have two more children, Katie and Janie. Joanne was a civil servant working in the local job centre. She was popular and had a good circle of friends, many of which she had known since her school days. She was good at sports, enjoying netball, rounders and swimming, and she was also very keen to travel. Joanne was close to her family and described by those who knew her as kind and considerate and that everyone she has ever known has only positive things to say about her. Joanne had been living in the Cottingham area of Hull with her fiancé, 30-year-old Paul Dyson, with whom she was said to be besotted for about a year. The pair were planning to marry in 2006 and were busy saving for their wedding and honeymoon to Mexico. On the evening of Valentine's Day 2005, Paul called the police to report Joanne missing. In the 14 minute phone call he said that he had last seen her at around 6.30am that morning. The pair had woken early and exchanged Valentine's cards before Paul kissed her goodbye and left to go to his job as a wood machinist. When he was asked if there had been an argument between the pair he replied, no, nothing like that. Joanne's Renault Clio was found unlocked outside their home. Joanne's mother, Jean, said that Joanne's disappearance was very out of character, adding that she is very close to her family and wouldn't do anything to upset us. It was established that a white three-quarter length coat, suede boots and a black handbag belonging to Joanne were missing from her home. With Joanne failing to call her sister to wish her a happy birthday and also missing a friend's father's funeral, Fears for her safety escalated still further. The police tried to establish what Joanne had been doing in the time leading up to her disappearance. She had been with her parents and sisters on Saturday the 12th of February. Then, on the 13th of February, Paul told how the two of them had spent a quiet day together going for a drive into the countryside, then, despite the wind and rain, going for a walk and having a picnic. They returned home and spent the evening watching television. The police began searching the area around Joanne's home. Helicopters were brought in with heat-seeking equipment. House-to-house -house inquiries were made. CCTV analysed and outbuildings, waterways and wasteland was searched. On the 16th of February, Paul broke down in tears as he described his fiancée to the cameras, saying, I love her to bits. I just want her back. She was always smiling. She had not got a bad bone in her body. I just want to know where she is. Adding that, I got up early on Valentine's Day. We swapped cards. I gave her a kiss and a cuddle. I pulled the cover over her so she could get her head down for another hour or so. I kissed her goodbye and went to work. That was it until I got home from work and she was not here. I had a quick phone around. If she disappears to her friends or anywhere, she lets me know. I just pray she is alright. There is no way I would do anything to harm her, and I don't know anyone who had a grudge. However, watching Paul's performance, the words that he had chosen, his eyes being kept tightly shut to squeeze out tears, was a detective superintendent, Ray Higgins, who also noticed two crescent-shaped cuts on Paul's thumbs. The detective knew that these were textbook throttling injuries, self-inflicted during the act of strangulation. Meanwhile, Joanne's parents released more photos of their happy-go-lucky daughter in an effort to gather more information from the public. They were simply desperate for their daughter to come home. There had been no positive sightings of Joanne and her mobile phone and credit cards had not been used. Then, on the 18th of February 2005, Paul was arrested on suspicion of murder. He was interviewed at length whilst the search for Joanne continued. 
On the 20th of February, the police were granted a 36-hour extension by magistrates to continue their questioning. The police sealed off Joanne and Paul's home to complete forensic tests and a computer was seized. They also examined the unnamed beauty spot close to a church near the Humber Bridge that Paul claimed the pair visited on the day before her disappearance. On the 21st of February, with still no sign of Joanne, Paul was charged with her murder. Details of Paul's past began to emerge. How many of these details that Joanne was aware of is unclear. Paul's father, Peter Dyson, who Paul idolised, had been jailed for six years prior to Paul's birth for the manslaughter of a man in Barnsley. When Peter was 22 years old, he stabbed a man by the name of John Dickinson to death with a kitchen knife during an argument over John's friendship with Peter's wife. Then, when Paul was just two days old, his father was involved in a fatal hit and run. 47-year-old Gordon Kell, a father of seven, was walking home with his family after celebrating his silver wedding anniversary. Peter was on his way home from visiting his infant son in hospital when he struck and killed Gordon before fleeing the scene. He escaped prosecution for this offence. Paul's father died of a heart attack in 2000 at the age of 55. Paul was said to be deeply affected by his death. The same year, his only child, Chloe, was born. Paul was married to Chloe's mother, Jenny Clark, for around 18 months. Paul was abusive during the marriage, on one occasion throttling Jenny until she passed out. Paul had few qualifications and worked in a number of low-paid jobs. He became interested in martial arts, training to brown belt standard in kickboxing, before later becoming passionate about bodybuilding, which would ultimately lead him to inject steroids. At times he worked as a doorman at the clubs and bars in Hull, where his colleagues described him as mouthy and loud. It was whilst he was doing that job that he met Joanne. It would later transpire that Paul had a close friendship with his trainer, Colin Allen, and confessed to Colin that he had killed Joanne. Colin then told Paul's mother what Paul had done, and she courageously took this information to the police. When confronted by the police with this knowledge, Paul admitted that he had lied. Despite the murder charge, there was still no sign of Joanne. Paul couldn't, or perhaps wouldn't, tell the police where her body was. He claimed to have just driven, taking no notice where he was going. He said that he could remember driving back through York and that there had been a metal gate and what looked like Christmas trees growing in the woods. The search for Joanne would become the biggest search operation ever carried out by Humberside Police. Hundreds of officers and army personnel combed around 300 square miles of often difficult terrain looking for Joanne. Poor weather conditions and heavy snow hampered the search. A forensic ecologist and botanist was brought in to analyse several items, including a lump of mud from Joanne's Renault Clio, and within a relatively short space of time had found pollen, primarily from four plant species, fern, hornbeam, silver birch and western hemlock. The discovery of western hemlock, a relatively rare evergreen conifer, matched Paul's description of Christmas trees at the place where he had left Joanne's body. These findings were sent to the region's Vice County Recorder, an individual appointed by the Botanical Society of the British Isles to catalogue plants, and as a result they were able to direct police to a 100 square kilometre area to the northeast of York, where these plants grew together. On the 25th of March, Almost 40 days after Joanne's disappearance, Detective Superintendent Ray Higgins, together with Detective Constable Philip Gadd, were searching within this area when they saw a metal gate, like the one that Paul had described, and behind it was western hemlock trees. They entered the woods and split up to search the area. Shortly afterwards, the lead detective on the case, Ray Higgins, found Joanne's body wrapped in bin liners and covered with branches and moss. A post-mortem determined that she had been strangled. On the 4th of May, Paul appeared at Hull Crown Court, where he was charged with Joanne's murder. 
He did not enter a formal plea, but his barrister, Gary Burrell, said it was important to know that he admits the unlawful killing. Joanne's funeral took place later in May at Hull Crematorium, packed with over 200 mourners. In August, Paul denied murdering Joanne, but pled guilty to her manslaughter. Prosecutor Andrew Hatton told Hull Crown Court that the plea was not acceptable and Paul was scheduled to stand trial for murder in November. The prosecution had built a strong case against Paul, stating that, on the evidence, the prosecution contend that he felt that she was losing interest in him and that he determined that if he was not to have her, then nobody else would. With his bare hands, he strangled to death the slightly built Joanne Jean Nelson. They believe that on the evening of the 13th of February, Joanne and Paul had been arguing about domestic chores and Joanne had asked Paul to put on a load of washing, something which he did not know how to do. An argument followed during which Paul lost his temper and strangled Joanne to death. CCTV footage would show him going to a nearby corner shop and calmly buying bin bags, rubber gloves and disinfectant in a bid to conceal her body and remove evidence from their home. He then drove to his mother's house to collect a garden fork in order to bury Joanne's body. Tying her body in bin liners, he then used her car to drive into the countryside to dump her. When he returned to his mother's house to return the garden fork, he casually chatted to the next door neighbour, asking if she'd had a good holiday. He told the neighbour that he was getting another cat and when the neighbour inquired after Joanne, he said, yes, she's fine. The following morning, Valentine's Day, he went to work as though nothing had happened. He even staged a mock conversation with Joanne on his phone that was overheard by a friend. Whilst awaiting his trial, Paul cut his wrists and wrote sorry in the blood on the prison walls. On what was meant to be the first day of the murder trial, Paul changed his plea to guilty of murder during a three-minute court hearing. Soon after, he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 16 years. Paul sobbed as he was sentenced with the judge condemning his breathtaking and nauseating hypocrisy in making a tearful TV appeal and the unspeakably evil deed that he had committed. In contrast, Joanne's family spoke with dignity and bravery, stating that we don't feel sorry for ourselves. We feel sorry for Joanne and the life that she will miss out on. We, her parents, her sisters, and all those who loved her have been cheated. Justice can never be done because Joanne can't come home, but we do consider ourselves lucky and privileged to be able to call Joanne our daughter and our sister. 14 years into Paul's sentence, it was revealed that, now 45, he had been moved to an open prison. Three years later, Paul was released from prison after serving 17 years. A year more than his minimum term, but far less than a life sentence. Which leads me to the question, should a life sentence mean life? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this case in the comments section below. Thanks for listening to The Crime Reel, and don't forget to join me at the same time tomorrow when we shall be looking at an Easter crime. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe and click like. Stay safe. Goodbye.